health outcomes, changes due to interventions. To bring positive change, patient experiences and health must both improve. Healthcare costs must be lowered, and clinician and staff burnout has to end. But our problems are big. 133 million Americans have at least one chronic disease. Half a million people are dying every year from hospital errors, injuries, and infection. The shortage of primary care professionals will be as much as 100,000 in just the next five years. Big problems require bigger solutions. Positive change needs acceleration. It needs to happen now. But these are not so easy solutions that many don't want to hear, and even few are willing to talk about. How to lead such a change? How to discover, discuss, and disrupt healthcare to make a difference now? This is Vitals, visionary health leadership in action. Good afternoon. My name is John Langell. I'm the president of Northeast Ohio Medical University, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to Vitals. Vitals is an open forum to discuss some of the nation's biggest healthcare problems and to hear from the leaders who are using the tools of VITALS to solve those issues. VITALS stands for Value, Innovation, Technology, Advocacy, Leadership, and Service. Today, I'm very pleased to be able to welcome Dr. Frank Beck as our speaker. Dr. Beck is the inaugural Dean of the Batante College of Dentistry at Northeast Ohio Medical University and the program director of the dental residency program at Mercy Health, St. Elizabeth Youngstown Hospital. Dr. Beck is also a leader in opioid abuse prevention. He has received the Ohio Department of Health Director's Task Force on Oral Health, as well as Oral Health Abuse Prevention Focus Group. He presently serves as Regional Chief Opioid Officer for Bon Secure Mercy Health, and was recently recognized with the Help Network 2018 Advocacy Award for outstanding service in the field of mental health and addiction recovery. In 2018, Dr. Beck received the Mercy Health Physician Leadership Clinical Opioid Expertise Award and was a member of the team that received national recognition for the Healthcare Information and Management Systems South Davies Award of Excellence for EHR in Improving Opioid Prescribing Practices. Dr. Beck is a fellow of the American Association of Hospital Dentists and received his Doctor of Dental Surgery degree from Ohio State University. And he received his and is completed his dental residency program at Mercy Health Youngstown. Please welcome. Dr. Beck. Dr. Beck, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Langell. I appreciate the introduction uh, as well as the invitation and opportunity to share uh, our vision with regards to developing a disruptive strategy to address a longstanding practice pattern of behavior of patients utilizing hospital emergency departments to receive non-emergent uh, services rendered by the physicians in the emergency department rather than at a lower acuity center. The title of our application is Definitive Care Solutions, a value-based innovation embracing technology to divert and connect patients presenting to hospital emergency departments for non-emergent conditions to a more appropriate healthcare setting in which they can receive definitive, not symptomatic care. Simply stated, patients receive the right care in the right setting at the right time. There are over 130 million emergency department visits annually as of year 2018 data. Eight to 43% of these ED visits are for non-emergent conditions. The recent study identified non-emergent dental conditions, also referred to as non-traumatic dental conditions, as representing three of the top 20 diagnoses for level one and level two emergency visits. Uh, slide one, please. <clears throat> A study completed in the year 2013-2014 uh, identified 
the dental disorders with regards to charges. You can see dental out of the top 20 represents one, seven, and 15 with regards to cost, a total cost of $290,000 to this single hospital emergency department, uh, providing symptomatic non-definitive care without a direct linkage of those patients to a site at which they could receive definitive care. It's important to note that the average cost of emergency department visit is $580 to $1,800 more than the cost of a comparable office visit rendered in a lower acute setting. And reminder, that's non-definitive symptomatic care. Next slide. So in 2013-14, we embarked upon a study to assess the top 20 diagnoses for our level one and level two ED visits with regards to number of visits and percentage of those visits relative to the total. You can see dental visits ranked number one, uh, four and 12, not unique to the state of Ohio. This data is national data as well. Uh, dental visits representing 13 to 15%. These are non-emergent, non-traumatic dental conditions. Uh, this data was gleaned by utilizing ICD-9 codes. Uh, Early on, uh, those are the codes in the 520s, and then we'll talk about the 720s in just a moment, as well as ICD-10 codes utilizing uh, K codes and M codes. The reason that 720 and M codes are so significant is those are codes which refer to jaw pain. And unfortunately, there's no standardization of dental patients presenting to hospital EDs, whereas they might simply be coded uh, in diagnosed as jaw pain. So if we add those in, the percentages become significantly more uh, with regards to 13 to 15%. Thank you, Michelle. Next slide is, so what is the prevalent protocols for addressing non-emergent dental conditions? Patients would present to the hospital emergency department receiving symptomatic non-definitive care, more oftentimes than not an analgesic opioid and an antibiotic, and a discharge instruction to follow up with a dental provider, but no linkage to a dental provider was made. What are those results? Well, obviously a delay in definitive care, a very low compliance and follow-up rate, and the follow-up rate and compliance can be linked directly to the number and quantity of opioids prescribed. Uh, and as I mentioned, increased opioid consumption uh, why the patient might be motivated day one as they're presenting with acute pain to receive their care once their care is palliatively obtunded by an opioid, uh, their motivation becomes less. All of these add up to significant healthcare costs to the emergency department as well as to the healthcare ecosystem. Important to note without resolve and more importantly, uh, exacerbation of coexisting medical comorbidities. The slide up here demonstrates a, a research project actually was done at the Department of Internal Medicine, Northeastern Ohio University's College of Medicine and Pharmacy, in which a 19-year-old individual was repetitively presented to a hospital emergency department for dental care uh, services, and unfortunately, was never linked to a definitive site to render care. Subsequently, three to four times, he represented to emergency department seeking symptomatic relief for his dental care. Unfortunately, uh, this 19-year-old man, next slide, presented his last time to the emergency department, uh, not with regards to dental, but with regards to severe headache, concussion, vomiting, nausea, confusion, and epileptic seizures. As you can see by the uh, publication of the MRI, this 19-year-old individual subsequently was identified as having three brain abscesses, uh, source of which was strep sanguinis, an oral microbiome resider. And unfortunately, this individual now uh, is become a ward of the state with uncontrollable epileptic seizures. 
So what is the significance of utilization of hospital emergency departments for non-emergent conditions? Well, significance is this, uninsured patients represent 47% of those presenting and Medicaid patients represent 25% of those presenting, representing 73% of the total patients utilizing a hospital emergency department to receive their non emergent dental care. The important to note that Medicaid, why it does cover some dental services, particularly in the state of Ohio, many states do not have adult dental Medicaid services, provide a limited scope of services, and there are a limited number of providers participating. So it's important that a network be created where hospital emergency departments can depopulate their patients presenting for hospital dental conditions directly with the warm handoff and linkage to a recipient site at which time they'll receive definitive care. It's important to note patients seeking definitive dental care in the ED oftentimes receive only symptomatic relief and enter or re-enter the system in the future presenting with more fulminant pathology uh, as described in this case report, these follow-up visits subsequently require more consumption and utilization of resources and oftentimes hospital admissions. So how do we address this issue? Well, a disruptive measure to better address this issue was the creation of the Definitive Care Solutions Operational Protocol, an interventional protocol to take patients, identify patients presenting to hospital emergency departments, and subsequently link them to a lower acuity site at which they can receive definitive care. Non-emergent dental patients presenting to a hospital emergency department between the hours of seven and four are redirected to a dental clinic that is designated as a definitive care recipient site at which time they receive care. This is accomplished via a link from the emergency department to the dental clinic, whereas the dental clinic provides designated protective slots to anticipate the number of patients presenting on a particular day. Metrics were calculated and as no surprise to anyone, Monday mornings and Friday afternoons were the highest rate of population of patients presenting to the hospital emergency departments in hopes of getting their dental services remedied. Interestingly enough, Thursday came in third. As we developed this particular definitive care operational protocol, there was no literature uh, available for us to determine what would be the compliance rate of a patient presenting to the ED and following up with regards to their dental referral. Uh, the anticipated rate of compliance we chose initially was 33% uh, comparing with regards to Medicaid utilization, broken appointments and compliance in that patient cohort. Unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, our, our rate of compliance was 78%. Uh, fortunately, because we, we've solved the situation with regards to the patients, unfortunately, because I overbooked the capacity of our dental clinic. Subsequently, that's been resolved and now we can handle the patient capacities uh, in good measure. Non-emergent patients presenting to the hospital emergency department after hours are diagnosed receive long-acting local anesthetics and or one or two narcotic pills, not a full prescription, and are scheduled at 7 a.m. at the next available dental clinic day. So on a Thursday, it would be Friday morning. On uh, Friday night would be Monday morning, Saturday, Sunday. And the number of narcotic pills and or long-acting local anesthetic prescription are titrated as such. Operationally in 2008, the Definitive Care Solutions Protocol was completed via a series of faxes and phone calls. It was a manual referral process, was labor intensive, time consuming, cumbersome, 
nonetheless, the process resulted in a 76% compliance rate representing significant cost savings. Diverting these non-emergent dental patients was estimated to save over $1.7 billion in the year 2014, which would translate well over $2 billion in the year 2021. What are the outcomes of this definitive care solution model? Well, immediate and definitive relief of pain, elimination of infection, interrupts the progression of pathology and mitigates exacerbation of other systemic morbidities. Patient compliance is ensured by providing a limited number of pain pills sufficient until the patient can get a definitive care solution appointment. Operational metrics suggest the possibility that established in this definitive care solutions model statewide and nationally may result in improvements to current delivery models interrupting the practice pattern of longstanding and may not only will result in significant cost savings, but significant cost avoidance. In 2008, the year this first study was first embarked upon, we can see the unnecessary ED visits by time of day. They were fairly linear and consistent. Next slide will demonstrate that the unnecessary ED visits by top 30 diagnoses uh, you can see dental on the bottom, extremely uh, number one by leaps and bounds. When we repeated this study in 2013, demonstrating the effectiveness of the definitive care solutions model, you can see a completely different time of day distribution for patients coming to the ED. Uh, see the majority of patients, it's almost a bell curve from 6 a.m. till about 4 p.m., the patients are presenting during times at which they know and understand they will receive definitive care, not symptomatic care and a reappointment. Remember, a lot of these patients have transportation issues, child care issues, access to care issues. So it's important that when they make the effort uh, to present for the care that we can present that care in a definitive manner. I believe in the sociological terms. This is called a nudge. Uh, thank you, Marla Morse, for pointing that out to me. And in concluding, next, we developed a implementation application so that rather than having the cumbersome papers, faxes, and phone calls, we wanted to harvest an innovation and technology to develop a, pro a software program to fully automate this referral process from hospital emergency department to an emergent uh, definitive care solutions referral site. This is the operational workflow algorithm that was developed. It begins in the middle of the page where patient registration, as the patient is registered uh, for dental, they are triage and off, oftentimes dental are very low in the triage. So they are sent back to the waiting room. In the waiting room, the hours may be three, four, five hours waiting, depending upon the severity of the triage patients presenting after them. And oftentimes these patients will left without being seen uh, and never ever get their situation resolved. If they are seated in the waiting room and then eventually do get triaged, they actually from the triage room will once again be reseated back in the waiting room until those individuals with higher priority triage situations are addressed. Those individuals as they leave are called elopement. Hospital emergency departments are graded on these metrics of left without being seen, elopement, time of presentation and time of conclusion, otherwise known as throughput. So our application actually is designed to get these patients to the right place at the right time fairly quickly. So if the patient's identified as non-emergent dental condition, we can utilize a QR code or a quick triage and send them a direct referral to the dental clinic or next day referral is after hours. Next slide. So what are the pilot studies of this? Well, we have a, a preliminary data utilizing this application. And it's important to note that this application is being beta tested at our St. Elizabeth Youngstown Hospital site in 20, 
13 as things were developed now in 2022. The challenge is that we already had a rather uh, impressive compliance rate of 76%, but nonetheless, the no-show rate for patients overall following up on their dental visits is about 74%. Among those referred to our dental clinic via the definitive care solutions application, no-show rate was decreased significantly uh, to 51%, uh, which represents a p-value of 0 0.001. Dr. Gamble, that's for you, my biostatistician. Uh, however, those individuals not utilizing the application, their no-show rate was 81%. The other important parameter that we're assessing is days to being seen in the dental clinic. Overall, all ED patients with their follow-up visit ranges anywhere between 12 to 24 days. When the definitive care solutions application was telescoped, follow up by 50% of p-value of 0.044, uh, taking the days from 16 to eight days. So significant with regards to the patient care, compliance, cost savings, cost avoidance, and mitigation of patient culminating pathologies. At this time, I'd like to introduce WKYC Senior Health Correspondent, Monica Robbins. Monica? Hi, thanks, Dr. Beck, and welcome to uh, our 75 participants in this uh, Zoom today. Um, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A, and I will be happy to uh, ask Dr. Beck. Um, Dr. Beck, I'd, I'd like to start with something, because we know that um, uh, dental care and, and damage to the teeth and diseases of, of the teeth um, have such a great impact on general health. Do you think medical schools are teaching this well enough or should there be more done? That's a great question. And the answer is historically no, but the contemporary yes. And so there's a tremendous amount of situations that are availed. And so uh, medical schools, and, I, and I, I'll speak for Neomed because uh, I'm in the process of teaching a course to Neomed students called Medical Dental Integration, where we have a three-week session uh, in the individuals in my classwork learn about those consequences of oral health with regards to the systemic overall health. So we're talking about pregnancy, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, uh, cardiovascular accidents, stroke, uh, centering pregnancy is a big issue, uh, with, as well as these days, a very significant issue is patients on MAT, medication-assisted treatment to aid in their recovery, buprenorphine, suboxone. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of devastation that occurs as a result of the pH of that medication and the mode in which it's administered. So it's important now standards of care and benchmarks have been created where we have dental prehabilitation, perihabilitation, and post-habilitation protocols. So individuals having orthopedic surgery, having a bariatric surgery, having cardiovascular surgery, uh, all need to have dental clearances to uh, be cleared for their elective surgery. Paul wants to know, is definitive care limited to dental or can it be used to depopulate other non-urgent patients in the ED? That's a great question, Paul. And the answer is no, it, it, the, the protocol is designed to be applicable to all non-emergent presentations to the emergency department. It's simply being beta tested in dental now. Rod wants to know, there was a recent news story about a person who lost some of their teeth and as a result lost their customer facing job due to a company smile policy. Can you talk about the impact that the lack of dental care access may have on someone's work life, social life and emotional state? That's a great question. And I'll share with you a, a, a personal experience. Uh, we, I alluded earlier to the fact that MAT patients are challenged with regards to the pH of the suboxone and 
their pre-existing dental condition. So individuals on MAT uh, without dental periabilitation will lose up to 20 teeth within the first one year of their induction of therapy. Uh, unfortunately, most of these individuals present with uh, dental devastation to begin with. So uh, one of the strategies that we've used is we worked out, reached out to the drug court and the judge with regards to the drug court is instructed with not criminalizing these activities, but decriminalizing them, providing recovery and support. And obviously support means getting back into the workforce. I'm, I'm proud to say that the Ohio Department of Health has been extremely helpful in their oral health section where individuals that require dentures, complete or partial, uh, to reestablish their smile, their self-image, their aesthetics and phonetics, and get them back into the workforce, uh, there is funds available from the Ohio Department of Health to do so. And we've accomplished quite a few of those in the last year. John wants to know, some dental programs claim to be opioid-free dentistry. What does that mean given the pain patients experience with dental procedures? That's a great question, and it, it tends to be a misnomer. Uh, <clears throat> opioid-free dental schools uh, are not really opioid-free. The term that we're going to use at our dental college is opioid responsible. So when we address acute pain, there are basically three platforms in which that can be done. The first is initiation of the pain, interrupting at that cycle. The second is at the transmission of pain, interrupting at that cycle. And the third is actually with the perception and reaction of pain. And that's actually where the opioids come in. Uh, it does, opioids are non-therapeutic with regards to addressing the initiation and transmission of pain. Uh, whereas with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, uh, steroids are all extremely effective in preventing the initiation of the pain cascade. And then subsequently, local anesthetics are wonderful with regards to preventing the transmission of pain. Uh, dentists, of course, are uh, probably the number one utilizer of local anesthetics, but I'm proud to say now in, uh, in our facilities uh, across our system, our surgical doctors are actually anesthetizing the patients at uh, just prior to discharge with long-acting local anesthetics to uh, circumvent that breakthrough pain uh, that is so often required. Oral health care delivery seems to be the only part of the body not treated by physicians. Why aren't dentists trained in medical schools? Good question. And, and that actually brings, uh, brings to light our College of Dentistry, the Batanti College of Dentistry here at Neomed, where our, our mission in design and strategic focus will be on interprofessional educational collaboration. So our dentists, our, our medical students, our pharmacy students, and our students in the College of Graduate Studies will all be trained together collaboratively, uh, taking into account not only the biomedical sciences, the clinical sciences, but the cross-discipline applications of each. Increasing the availability of dentists takes care of one issue, but what happens to those who lack good dental insurance? That's a great question, and that's one that's being addressed on a number of issues. Uh, one of the things that's very important to understand is that while we have preserved and protected adult dental Medicaid in the state of Ohio, the fee schedule for adult dental Medicaid is based upon the year 2000, yes, 22 years old, 30% of the UCR at that time. So Obviously, that is not a very sustainable model in which that we can have lots of individuals practice. Hence, most of individuals receiving dental care that are on Medicaid or uninsured do so in, in the federally qualified health centers, dental residencies, dental clinics, and colleges of dentistry. So we provide a valuable resource and as as our footprint expands, we'll be able to have 50 students per year graduating 
in adding to the dental workforce. The other big piece with that is presently uh, in the year 2025, which is the first year we're projecting an entering class at our college of dentistry, uh, Ohio will be 672 dentists short of where we need to be to address the healthcare needs of our individuals. And lastly, and most importantly with fingers crossed, the Ohio Dental Association has been advocating for medic increase of Medicaid fees dentally. And presently those fees are projected to be an increase of 70%. Increase of 70% would, you, would increase utilization across uh, the state. We know that from some studies that have been done by Delta Dental in Michigan, but the point was well taken. Even if we increase the fees, but don't increase the capacity of workforce, we're still going to have a capacity issue. So we need to increase the workforce, increase the fees, increase utilization, and better serve our public. I just want to remind our panelists that if you have any questions for Dr. Beck, please put them in the Q&A section. Um, Dr. Beck, has implementation of the definitive care concept played a role in any legislative advocacy and policy changes? It certainly has, and I, I'm, I'm proud to share with you what, what we were able to accomplish in, in this realm. Prior to the advent of this definitive care concept, adult dental Medicaid reimburse the provider as follows. If an individual would come to a dental office for a dental emergency, receive an exam, receive an x-ray and receive an extraction, the way that that particular dental provider was paid was based upon the lesser, I guess would be the least of those three fees. So an x-ray was $6, uh, the extraction would be 70 and the exam would be 15. They would not get paid 91, they would get paid $6. So the way that system worked was counterintuitive to what it was we were hoping to accomplish, hoping to accomplish definitive care, not symptomatic care. I'm proud to date subsequent to the introduction and implementation of the definitive care concept, Medicaid now pays for all three of those services provided coincidentally, and actually some of the PPO Medicaid providers provide an incentive called episodes of care. So if you're an individual that is providing definitive care services in the metrics of that one particular PPO uh, Medicaid provider notices that, you will get big bonuses in addition to the services provided. With there being more baby boomers than ever, have we seen an increase in seniors who need dental care and does Medicare cover them? That's a great question. And absolutely, there's a huge increase in the number of seniors available uh, that require dental care. And I'll take a little aside at this point. Individuals that have dentures and don't have any teeth require dental care at least as much as those individuals with teeth. Why would that be? Well, these individuals are wearing dentures. And what we've come to know through a number of studies that's that the number one presentation of patients from nursing homes and institutions being admitted to hospital emergency departments is for strep pneumonia. These individuals actually have contaminated dental prosthesis and we observed as they were in the hospital and were under antibiotic care, their dentures are sitting on the tabletop next to them. Once they are uh, rendered in, upon able to be discharged, they go home, they stick their dentures back in their mouth, contaminated, and they self-inoculate themselves. And if they represent to the hospital within 30 days, there actually the hospital gets penalized based upon a 30 day readmission metric. So one of the things we've learned with the seniors is number one, we need to disinfect the dentures and demonstrate to them how to effectively do so. The other hand on that is what happens to those individuals that are dentulous and have teeth, whether they be partial or a complete set of dentition, there are a whole bunch of unique dental needs in the geriatric population. Generally, these patients are um, 
on polypharmacological regimens where their mouths are actually extremely dry as side effects. Uh, the dry mouth eliminates the pH, eliminates the buffering, dilutant and uh, lubricating capacities. They tend to get a high incidence of what's called root caries on these individuals and can be rather devastating. So the elderly population needs dental care significantly from one, from the pharmacy piece of the saliva. And the second piece, the salivary glands, like the rest of us as we age, they atrophy and don't work as effectively. So that becomes a big challenge. Medicare has talked for years about having uh, a dental component that's being discussed in Congress as, as we see now, but traditionally Medicare does not cover dental services uh, as we would like them to be. So there's uh, it's being discussed, and that would be very, very, very helpful in that realm. Staying on the coverage uh, track here, is there any consideration at the state or federal level to make dental insurance much more similar to other health conditions, uh, such as an 80-20 or 90-10 split, so the individuals have less barriers to at least consider early intervention or prevention so that less tertiary care is necessary? That actually is indeed being discussed at both state and national levels uh, with regards to um, requiring the dental providers to reflectively administer the funds that they receive from the premiums in a manner very similar and parallel to medical so that what is being collected is uh, being utilized 80% of the time with the patient's direct care, not with administrative and other, other costs. Are you able to discuss how new technology innovation is changing dental care and affecting cost and access? As an example, how is 3D printing being utilized for implants and prosthetics? <clears throat> Great question. And we're going to see a huge shift in, in dental uh, care over the next decade or so uh, with the advent of CAD CAM, so computer assisted design and computer assisted technology, we are able to deliver prosthetic appliances that are actually accurate, produced at a very rapid rate and actually produced at an extremely cost effective rate as well. So that traditionally, as we might say, the analog system where most of us are familiar with getting uh, our impressions in our mouth with the gooey rubber and things, and then subsequently in racing the lab technician who is more of an artist at this point in time and a technician to deliver and create a prosthesis and then send it back to you for seating. The role of the laboratory technician is now migrating to become what somewhat of a CAD CAM operator where we can actually have these files. Uh, we are actually embarking upon a digital dental um, project where individuals that are showing up for care on our rural health site, so access to care problems, challenges, uh, we address that with mobile dental vans. We can do an intraoral screening and scan, uh, send that over the internet uh, to the laboratory, have the laboratory print out the prosthesis and send back. Extremely cost effective, uh, both in terms of materials and cost, but also in terms of time and capacity. All right, uh, what population segments are at greatest risk when it comes to the lack of dental care and what in a perfect world would be the quickest fix for these groups of people to get them the care they need? How about if I say all? I'll share with you what, what I mean. So individuals uh, in Ohio, uh, we embarked upon a project many years ago uh, called Centering Pregnancy, where Ohio, unfortunately as a state, was ranked amongst the lowest in the country with regards to infant mortality and preterm birth weights. Um, dental conditions play a huge role with regards to that. So again, uh, what we need to do is a continuum of care with uh, embedding dental care at each site. So pregnant moms, 
let's have pregnant mom prehabilitation. Our study in our centering pregnancy at our facility demonstrates that 100% of pregnant women in our centering pregnancy model requires significant dental rehabilitation, not simply a cleaning and fluoride. They required extractions and restorative uh, restorations, a number of fillings and extractions. So 100% of them to this point, and I believe we're in our eighth year with regards to that. And that should continue. People say, well, when should my child present to the dentist? My answer would be, when does your child go to the pediatrician? Unfortunately, children see the pediatrician 18 times before they see a dentist. And, and most often the common myth is, well, when my child is three, they should come and see a dentist. Well, oftentimes that's the dentist assessing the behavior of the child and understanding that hopefully that child will be better behaved at three than at one. Uh, the answer is continuum. So we like to see every child should have a dental home by age one and that dental care should continue throughout their continuum. Are you saying every child, as soon as their teeth come in, they should go find a dental home? Nope, prior to that, they, as soon as they are discharged from the hospital and they have their first visit with the pediatrician, they should have their first visit with the dentist. Why so? There's no teeth in the mouth. Well, there's a process called anticipatory guidance where we can educate the mother with regards to care of the, the child's edentulous mouth as well as diet. Uh, diet and nutrition play a huge role. And we do know that they, uh, those individuals, moms, particularly the oral care in the oral condition of the mother's mouth is the number one prognostic indicator of the dental outcome and status of the child. Remember, <clears throat> remember dental decay is infectious, contagious, intransmissible as is periodontal disease. Um, this person thinks it's a silly question, but I, I don't. Uh, dental fashion, such as the uh, gold-plated teeth, are those potentially damaging? <clears throat> That's not a silly question. The gold-plated teeth or grills are an extremely popular cultural thing. And the answer is they can be depending upon the time of wear in the number of hours in contact. So to answer your question, uh, if they are worn 24 hours a day, they're extremely detrimental. Uh, they will accumulate plaque, prevent oral hygiene measures and um, promote tooth decay. If they're worn on a um, cultural kind of jewelry sort of thing, not so much. So it has to do with the amount of contact with regards to that. A very popular thing now with our patients that we're making complete dentures, uh, they are requesting grills and gold teeth in them as well. Charles wants to know, he, he asks if you would comment on dental hygiene and cardiovascular risk reduction. <clears throat> That's a great question. And, and number one, as I mentioned earlier, most facilities now require a dental clearance of the patient prior to cardiovascular disease. Uh, it's important to note uh, that we talk about medical dental integration, but we do know that individuals that have cholesterol, high cholesterol and challenges with the cholesterol um, in the clogging up their arteries, so to speak, there is actually an activating enzyme called fusobacteria endotoxin that is actually the initiating factor for the, the cholesterol being able to penetrate through the endothelial junction, which is that single cell junction that allows that cholesterol into the lumen of the artery, which begins the cascade. If it's in the heart, the cascade becomes a myocardial infarction if it's in the brain, it becomes a stroke. So we know extremely well, Fusobacterium nucleotidum is, is one of the bad agents. We call it a, a red agent. And so there's a that's the rationale for why we provide dental clearance for patients. 
And there's actually an entire discipline that addresses that called perioprotect, where there's a number of primary care docs, cardiologists that require individuals to be on these protocols, particularly if they're high risk. You brought up dental specialties. What specialty is the most needed in Ohio to increase quality of care? Without question right now, specialties, we have challenges in the pediatric realm. We have challenges in the oral maxillofacial surgery realm. Uh, those would be the two, uh, and mo most of which is because they are critically involved in acute care. Uh, I was just recently contacted by a, uh, the president of a hospital uh, that it also is an ED doc by training. And his biggest challenge in our, his hospital emergency department is pediatric dental care and pediatric trauma. So we need to find linkages to establish that. Uh, the other specialties are, are also in shortage, but they don't deal in the acute care emergent situation. Uh, so pediatric dentist, I believe presently we only have five residencies in the state of Ohio, uh, each of which may be producing two or three uh, specialists a year. And then, of course, oral maxillofacial surgeons, uh, we could, uh, we need lots of them because we're only talking about non-emergent trauma here. But when we start to factor in emergent trauma and facial fractures, uh, Gunshot wounds, stabbing wounds, altercations becomes a huge need. I just want to remind our participants, we still have some time left. If you have any questions for Dr. Beck, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, Dr. Beck, with wearables, interoperables, and so many other ways for people to monitor their own health, are there any innovations that allow someone to monitor their oral health? That's a good question of which I, I'm not sure I have an evidence-based answer for that. There are applications out there, uh, but I'm not totally convinced that those are uh, with, with significantly uh, demonstrable uh, efficacy on that piece. You mentioned that the definitive care solutions um, software was already being utilized in your hospital. Is it being used elsewhere? And what's the status of the application um, with regards to processes and implement, implementation? Uh, great question. We are, uh, St. Elizabeth Youngstown Hospital it has been chosen as the beta site to test it for dentally. So presently the applications and beta testing only at St. Elizabeth, St. Elizabeth Youngstown Hospital and to date, there have been no financial rewards with, re, with result with regards of that. Um, the plan is to demonstrate efficacy uh, and then expand to a second hospital, uh, hopefully April of this year. So that's next month, I suppose, at this point in time. Um, the uh, situation I alluded to earlier where we've been extremely effective with regards to our definitive care since 2008-2013. So even though we've moved the dial significantly as demonstrated by those p-values uh, with our application, it's our suspect that by going to a hospital that has never had a definitive care concept, that dial is gonna be significantly impacted and create a very compelling story. This participant wants to know what made you become a dentist? What made me become a dentist? Let me see, I have enough time? No. I, I, I can actually share with you that. I, I, I wanted to be a cardiovascular surgeon early on. I was of the vintage when Dr. Christian Barnard was actually uh, doing the first heart transplant in South Africa, and that impacted me rather significantly. Uh, as, as I ventured through high school and college, I began, I was fortunate enough to uh, mentor with a chief surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic, and uh, I was one of three that he, he selected, and we got to operate, uh, participate, and observe his operations. and. Uh, I was all set to be a cardiovascular surgeon, uh, 
I, I wasn't real excited about the fact that uh, surgeons don't really interact with their patients. Oftentimes they're already in state of general anesthesia. They become extremely meticulous technicians. Uh, but I kind of started to migrate toward uh, working with the patient in a conscious sedate and actually utilizing uh, behavioral health measures to help guide the patient through our encounters, so to speak. And probably the nail in the coffin was the first time I ever witnessed anybody die. And uh, that was, uh, was a rather compelling moment for me. I, I can still conjure up all those emotions some 48 years later. And I decided that I get upset when teeth break and, and things. Uh, so that wasn't that I decided that was a good Lord telling me where I wanted to be. I still have lots of medicine uh, that I get to apply on a daily basis, but uh, fortunately, my practice is fatality free at this point. Dental schools often struggle to provide enough procedures for their students, and many are graduating with limited experience. Should a residency be required given the dental school deficit? That's a great question, and the answer would be residencies are wonderful. I've been associated with one for 40 years. The challenge is funding and clinical facilities to do so. But having said that, there's a tremendous amount of need in our state. In fact, the number one unmet healthcare need of our citizens in the state of Ohio is dental. As I alluded to earlier, the number one reason patients present to hospital EDs is dental. So there's plenty of work out there what needs to be done is somebody looking at it in a different lens and creating a, a disruptive uh, strategy to do so. So our dental college at Neomed will actually do both. Uh, we're actually partnering uh, with a number of dental residencies, uh, federally qualified health centers and uh, community and uh, health sites to actually uh, embed our students into these sites where they might be limited with regards to workforce, increase their workforce, provide care and services to our patients where our patients are being presented, and actually helping because one of the challenges, as we mentioned, with workforce is federally qualified health centers oftentimes are challenged with recruiting and retaining dentists. Well, our model hopes that if these individuals are exposed to these sites, uh, it becomes an auditional interview bi-directionally. So if I'm the program director and, and I'm working with you and say, wow, what a great employee this would be. And conversely, you say the same, then we've provided not only uh, services for the betterment of the individual, uh, in their dental care, the community and its dental health, but also contributing to the workforce. So the answer is yes, the dental uh, procedural experiences has declined significantly uh, from one, one I was about. However, I think we have a model where we're going to address that. Our individuals are gonna get a, a lot of procedural experiences, uh, not nearly as much as I did way back because when I was in the dark ages back when, there was no other place for individuals to go except for dental schools. Our dental college, I'm a graduate of Ohio State, uh, had a waiting list of patients to get in. That's not the case these days. Uh, this attendee wants to know, what's the difference between DDS and DMD? Uh, DDS is a doctor of dental surgery. DMD is a doctor of dental medicine. Uh, the degree is, the difference is simply this college from which you graduate. Does climate, pollution, coastal areas, temperature have an impact on our teeth? That would have an impact on our overall health and well-being. So to answer your question, yeah. All right. Final thoughts you would love to leave our uh Neomed graduates with as they head out, if they haven't, if they're not going to dental school, uh, what you would like them to remember the next time they see a patient? 
Well, that's exactly what the course that I'm teaching, medical dental integration, well, I'll be talking on March 14th as they return back from spring break. And the answer is that uh, the silos are gone. Medical dental integration is here to stay. Uh, we know that because some of the insurance industry is beginning to reimburse for individuals to receive dental care that have been identified with diabetes, cardiovascular disease, stroke, and other neurological disorders because they understand, and it's been demonstrated in an evidence-based fashion, that these individuals, uh, providing them with more frequent dental care, results in downstream cost savings and downstream cost avoidance. So hopefully we'll all be working together. Our patients will benefit, our communities will benefit, and the emergency departments will benefit because they won't be taking care of non-emergent situations. They'll be taking care of emergent situations, which they're better suited to do. Dr. Beck, thank you so much for an insightful discussion, and thank you to our participants. Dr. Langel, I'll hang, hand it back to you. Thank you, Monica. And Monica, thank you for your expert moderation, as always. Dr. Beck, that was an outstanding presentation. I want to thank you for all the great work you do to improve oral health and also to prevent opioid and substance abuse within our region. Until next time, I hope that you are all well and safe and actively engaged for you are the change agents for healthcare following the role models that we see on this presentation. Join us next time for Vitals on April 6th when we will be joined by Dr. Michael Forbes, the Chief Academic Officer of Akron Children's Hospital. Thank you. Health outcomes, changes due to interventions, to bring positive change, patient experiences and health must both improve. Healthcare costs must be lowered, and clinician and staff burnout has to end. But our problems are big. 133 million Americans have at least one chronic disease. Half a million people are dying every year from hospital errors, injuries, and infection. The shortage of primary care professionals will be as much as 100,000 in just the next five years. Big problems require bigger solutions. Positive change needs acceleration. It needs to happen now. But these are not so easy solutions that many don't want to hear, and even few are willing to talk about. How to lead such a change? How to discover, discuss, and disrupt healthcare to make a difference now? This is Vitals, visionary health leadership in action.